What is the social model of disability? I'll explain it in 14 seconds. 14 seconds is a pretty short period of time. Less than a quarter of a minute. Could you wait 14 seconds to give someone a chance to talk or respond to a question? This isn't a casual question. The average gap between typical talkers is two seconds. I think I could maybe last a second, maybe. What if you have a communications disability? While in the middle of another study, some researchers simply waited and listened to a set of 12 young adolescents who were identified with having minimal verbal skills and labeled with autism or other developmental disabilities. All the researchers did was wait. Wait and give these young people a chance to speak at their own pace. No hurrying, no interventions, no therapy, no interruptions, just wait. And the researchers found out that just by waiting, these kids with minimal verbal skills could communicate conversationally just fine. They weren't incapable of articulate speech or thoughtful ideas. They just needed some time. Can you wait 14 seconds? We're going to find out right now. Just listen. Don't speed up the episode. Don't do anything. Just listen. Here we go. How did you hold up? It was hard for me to sit there saying nothing, doing nothing. Imagine being on the other side of the experience that all you need was for someone to wait for 14 seconds for you to gather your thoughts and to say what you wanted to say. Just 12 seconds of patience between being considered normal and being considered disabled. Would you get angry, frustrated? I'm sure you've been in a conversation where someone won't let you get a word in edgewise. Imagine work, school, friendships, family, everything, if you just needed those 14 seconds. Oh, and that was the average. That means half the group needed more time. But if you give it to them, they can communicate just fine. Welcome to the social model of disability. And welcome to uh, episode nine of Disability Democracy. I'm Stephen Davis, your host. This weekly podcast is about practical actions that you can take to make a difference in your community. The goal of Disability Democracy is to accelerate the disability community revolution. Find out more at disabilitydemocracy.org. Disability studies academics talk about the medical model of disability and the social model of disability. The two models are much more than just academic, however. The medical model and social model are actually useful ways to understand what disability actually is and how it is experienced. First, the medical model of disability. It is usually pretty straightforward and what we think of when we think of disability. The medical model of disability sees disability as an illness to be diagnosed and treated cure or care, as the scholars say when they're being a bit flip, and our healthcare system favors in many ways, many, many ways, cure treatments to care treatments. But we'll come back to that later. What is interesting is that the medical diagnosis is itself actually social. We interpret symptoms differently depending on someone's diagnosis. And you may not wind up with a different diagnosis if you go see your general practitioner, a neurologist, or a psychologist. In Martha Leary and Ann Donnellan's book, Autism, Sensory Movement, Differences, and Diversity, the authors group descriptions of symptoms for Parkinson's disease, Tourette's syndrome, and autism together. And if you didn't know which one you were looking at, you wouldn't know which symptom went with which diagnosis. 
This isn't just a clinical issue. It affects everything. If an emotional outburst is associated with a disease or neurological condition, it can be socially accepted as a symptom. But if it is associated with a developmental disability, like autism, it is a behavior to be managed. This is the essence of the social model of disability. The social model of disability argues that disability is created by a society. The social model argues that disability exists because we've built it intentionally or not. The social model of disability is pervasive. It exists at an interpersonal level, simply waiting long enough to give someone a chance to speak or dealing with our reactions to different physical appearances. It exists at the communal level and so on and on up to our cultural and public and private systems. And if you are disabled, it shapes your life every day. My most obvious personal experience of disability comes via my autistic son. Now, if you are a parent or you have friends with kids, you probably know kids who have something extra going on in their life. Maybe they are an aspiring athlete or musician, or they have an illness or injury. I have a friend right now whose son may be a professional baseball player. None of these are something that parents really expect. But you've seen it. They deal with it. So does everyone around them. They adapt. Autism itself is kind of the same for us. It's something extra in our lives. It definitely makes things different, but autism doesn't cause our family major stress or financial concerns. However, the social model, really the social construct of disability, is kind of a nightmare. And it's a crazy feedback loop you experience the discomfort that others have with your child's disability, so you are less social. Or you project your concern with their potential discomfort, and the result is the same. You don't just send your kid off to school, you deal with special education. A whole system within our public schools that seems like a crazy cross of Alice in Wonderland, Catch-22, and 1984. Healthcare that doesn't seem to be about delivering treatment, but delivering minutes. Endless forms, surveys, applications, appeals. It is exhausting. Not the disability itself, not autism. Autism doesn't create daily co-pays for therapy. Our health system is biased against care treatments. Heart surgery... A cure treatment definitely costs tens of thousands of dollars, only has one copay. Therapy sessions may cost a hundred or a couple of hundred dollars each, but there's a copay for each. The first year that my son was eligible for behavioral therapy, we hit our out of pocket maximum pretty quickly. My parents, who both had heart surgery that year, both of them didn't. This is a choice. Nothing forces therapies to cost families thousands of dollars a year. We wrote the laws that say minimum wage doesn't apply to people with disabilities. We designed our assistance programs for disabled adults so they can't work, can't get married, can't accumulate wealth like the rest of us, or they'll lose their supports that they need to live. How would you like your health insurance to operate like that, or Social Security? Imagine this. You need heart surgery. No problem. Go get divorced, quit your job, sell all your assets. You have to be poor to get covered heart surgery. This is our system when you swap disability services or even elder care for heart surgery. <laughs> Just a reminder that you can find full episode transcripts and additional resources at disabilitydemocracy.org. We welcome your comments, feedback, and suggestions. You can subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you additional information and insights, as well as uh, other resources for every episode. 
let us know how we can make disability democracy more accessible and actionable for you. If you looked at me or talked to me, you wouldn't consider me disabled. I don't consider myself disabled, but I've worn glasses since I was in first grade. My vision is pretty bad. I didn't think about the system for vision care until recently when my friends started telling me about their cheap glasses online. My friend said, hey, Steve, you can get glasses for 50 bucks. Wow. I went to check it out. It wasn't $50 for me. My glasses still cost five times that, probably more. I've been buying glasses every couple of years, or my parents did when I was a kid, for almost 50 years now. That's thousands and thousands of dollars. I never even thought about it. I have the privilege and I can afford it or my parents could afford it. Why aren't glasses covered in our standard health insurance in the U.S.? Not the fancy frames or features, just the glasses. You know, so people can see. Shouldn't we make sure everyone can see affordably? What would be the return on investment for universal eye care? And it isn't just vision. I guess I'm falling apart. When we were trying to figure out what was up with my then two-year-old son, we had his hearing tested. Uh, for little kids, it's very different from an adult. He happily sat in my lap in this funky booth. He was responding to sounds and speakers spread around the room. He was having a great time. His body and face were reacting to all sorts of sounds. His hearing was fine. But I realized I had a problem. I needed hearing aids at 52. If you don't need hearing aids, you may not know it, but they are quite expensive. Just to start, they can be $1,000 per year and go up to more than $2,500 for each year. And they aren't covered by your health insurance. I was shocked. I've had what I thought was good health insurance my whole life, and hearing aids aren't covered at all. People go without hearing aids or even buy just one because they are so expensive. And what is worse is that there is actually a huge difference between the quality of hearing you get from a $1,000 hearing aid and a $2,500 hearing aid. I owe you an episode on buying hearing aids. Bug me if I haven't, and if you have questions, just email me. Hearing shouldn't be a luxury. Vision shouldn't be a privilege. You hear complaints about lazy people not working, yet we have the tools to help people see, hear, live, and work. We intentionally, financially, socially, and culturally penalize people for their differences. Not just for the big D disabilities like Down syndrome or spinal bifida or muscular dystrophy, but for nearsightedness and hearing loss. It's what disability activists call ableism. It is the social model of disability. It is about all of us not even being willing or patient enough to wait 14 seconds for free just to give another person a chance to speak. This episode of Disability Democracy was sponsored by Not Without Us. Not Without Us is a 501c4 mutual benefit corporation. Our goal is equality for all disabled adults and kids with disabilities. You can learn more about our work at notwithoutus.org. Our strategy is built on democratic action. Through this podcast or in our community at disabilitydemocracies.org, we uh, provide support for organizers, uh, training for political candidates, endorsing candidates, or working directly on issues ourselves. Uh, again, go to notwithoutus.org. We'd like to thank Ian McCullough and Debbie Dodge for their contributions to Not Without Us. You can support Not Without Us with an annual, monthly, or one-time donation at notwithoutus.org. If you have any questions or comments on this episode, visit disabilitydemocracy.org. You can email us, leave a comment, or even a voice message. 
I'm Stephen Davis, and on behalf of Not Without Us, we think that democracy comes not from a vote every two years, but from the actions that we can take every day.